Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, okay, so let me start with the screen share. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, okay, so, right, so, so today's lecture is going to be, right, so we, we've been talking about quadratic forms over, uh, over the past, uh, past couple of lectures, uh, and today we're going to sort of, I guess, have a little bit of a reset, um, and uh, so there will be no quadratic forms today. Um, instead, we will talk about the, um, well, so I will introduce the, the piadic numbers, which um, will play a, a central role in the the rest of um, um, rest of these these three weeks. Um, okay, so yeah, so so today's lecture is going to be about the piadic numbers and um, um, uh, and some of its um, its properties. So the idea of the piadic numbers is that uh, so they're going to be built. So they're they're a sort of number system that uh, will be built in a in a way that you're supposed to think of as analogous to the construction of the real numbers. So. Well, although I, I guess I said that we, you know, I guess I said quadratic forms are going to play a central role today. Let's just sort of go back to our original motivation, which is we want to talk about, um, you know, we want to know when we can solve a quadratic equation. When, when, when so when, when is a quadratic form isotropic over the rational numbers? Um, and one of the obstructions is, um, you know, it, it needs to be it needs to be isotropic over over the real numbers, which is uh, conditional on signs. Um, so. The idea is that we're going to get a bunch of other obstructions which come uh, at each prime p from the piadic numbers, and together they're going to be enough. Okay, so with this in mind, let's let's first start by recalling the construction of the real numbers. Right, so so somehow the idea is that this construction of the piadic numbers is, is sort of parallel to the construction of the real numbers, and a lot of concepts that we can sort of do over the real numbers are going to have sort of analogs in in the in the piadic world. Um, but ah, sorry, there is a chat um okay well uh, maybe i will keep going um yeah so let's recall the construction of the real numbers so yeah so you know you've seen the construction of the real numbers for example via dedekind cuts um but actually for, for this talk it'll be more convenient to use the construction via cauchy sequences um, because edic and cuts rely on the ordering of the real numbers, which we're not going to have um, in the setting. So, so recall the construction of the real numbers. Uh, an element of uh, R uh, is an equivalence class. Um, of Cauchy sequences. X sub i, uh, where these are rational numbers. Um, and so it's a Cauchy sequence, meaning that the difference is X i minus X j go to zero as i and j go to infinity. Um, and right, so maybe I should write that. So Cauchy sequences, i.e. X i minus X j goes to zero as i comma j go to infinity. And well, it's an equivalence class, so I need to specify the equivalence relation. Uh, so, so here, a sequence x sub i and a sequence y sub i are equivalent, so they define the same real number. Uh, if the difference x sub i minus y sub i uh, goes to zero, uh, as i goes to infinity. So in particular, it's defined as, uh, as sort of a completion of the real numbers where we sort of add in formal limits of, uh, of Cauchy sequences, and we mod out by the natural equivalence relation um, Sorry, so there's there's a lot of echo. Oh, okay. Um, let me see. Is that a problem with my audio? Um, the reason, sorry, the reason for echo is because I'm giving oral instructions in Sokoko to people to switch to a different Zoom, and some people are in a different Zoom. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Ah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to continue. Um, okay, so right, so it's possible to sort of axiomatize this uh, uh, somehow uh, more generally, um, and so yeah, so we'll use the following definition. Okay, so um, let K be a field. 
uh, and then an absolute value. Right, so an absolute value on a field k uh, is a function. Uh, so just use the usual absolute value sign. And it goes from k to the non-negative reals. And it has the following uh, properties. So one is that you have the triangle inequality. So absolute value of x plus y is less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus y. Uh, it's multiplicative. So the absolute value of x times y is the absolute value of x times the absolute value of y. Um, and finally, uh, uh, right, so the absolute value of x, it's, it's a non-negative real number. And it's, it's 0 if and only if uh, x is equal to 0. Um, so this is the notion of an absolute value on, on a field k. And right, so for example, we have the usual absolute value. Uh, on the rational numbers. OK, so if you're given an absolute value uh, on a field k, then uh, the field k acquires the structure of a metric space. So given an absolute value, uh, the field k becomes a metric space. Uh, so where the distance between to elements x and y is the absolute value of their difference. Um, and uh, right, so we're going to say that a, a field with an absolute value is complete. So we're going to say that k is complete uh, if, if this metric space is complete. And right, so so what what does uh, so so that means that every Cauchy sequence converges. Okay. And so now, whenever we have a field with an absolute value, um, we have the following general construction. So. Given a field k with an absolute value, okay. uh, so then there's always, so it might not be complete to begin with, but there's always a way of sort of enlarging it to make it complete. Um, so one can form the completion. Uh, which is a larger field, so it's called this completion I don't know, k hat. So, which is an extension of k. Uh, so it's an extension of k and the absolute value. So the absolute value on k also extends to k hat, uh, which is complete. And in fact, it's the, the minimal extension of k together with its absolute value, which is, uh, which is complete. So just, um, Okay, so how is this defined? Well, this is defined, uh, I guess it's defined as the completion of the metric space, that uh, the underlying metric space of, of the field K. So K hat is explicitly constructed uh, as the metric space completion. Uh, so in other words, uh, as equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences in K. Uh, okay. So for example, uh, if we use the usual absolute value on the uh, uh, on the rational numbers, then the real numbers are the completion with respect to this absolute value. So, for example, sorry. So the real numbers uh, are the completion of Q with the usual absolute value. 
Um, and so you might object that this definition is maybe a little bit, is a tiny bit circular because right now we defined an absolute value as something that takes values in the real numbers. Um, so yeah, so maybe if one is defining, make, using this as a definition, one should be a little bit more careful how one sets it up, but I'm gonna assume we have the real numbers to begin with. So, so we won't worry too much about that. Um, okay, so, but in general, the idea is that this construction of the completion of, uh, um, uh, of a field with an absolute value is, uh, is some sort of generalization of the usual of the, of the construction of the real numbers via Cauchy sequences. Um, okay. So maybe let me give one more example. Uh, sorry, so there's a question from Left to Real. Yeah, I just go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. I wanted to ask whether, just to make sure if I, if I remember things correctly. So this completion, if we have a valued field K, now mm -hmm. that is unique up to isometric isomorphism, right? So any other completion right. is not just isometric, but also isomorphic as fields. Yes. Oh, great, thank yes. you. <laughs> yes, it's completely, yeah, it's completely canonical. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, like the completion of the metric space. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So maybe just another example I want to give is uh, um, right. So um, you can define an absolute value. So let's consider uh, the rational numbers where you've added a square root of minus one, so q adjoin uh, i, and define an absolute value. such that the absolute value of a plus i times b uh, is a squared plus b squared. Um, so, uh, sorry, I guess I should say square root of a squared plus b squared. Um, so this is an absolute value uh, and uh, the completion is gonna be given by the complex numbers. So, um, right, so, so I, I define this notion of an absolute value uh, and I guess the, right, so, so, so the point is that the key observation is that, right, so we can get the real numbers and the complex numbers using this construction, uh, but, but the key observation is that there are a lot, there are many more examples of absolute values uh, on the rational numbers. Um, so key observation, there, are many more examples of absolute values on the rational numbers. So we have the usual absolute value function, um, but, uh, but there are lots of other examples and uh, that sort of satisfy the same axioms. And there's, well, okay, there's, first of all, there's a very boring example, which is the trivial absolute value. So um, define an absolute value, and this actually works on any field, so define absolute value um, such as the absolute value of x is equal to one if x is not zero uh, and zero if x equals zero. So this is gonna, right, so this is, this is gonna give you a discrete topology or discrete metric space on, um, on the field or this works on any field. Okay, so this is not so interesting, but we should mention it. Um, Right, but so in fact, on the rational numbers, there, there, there are going to be a whole bunch of absolute values, uh, which uh, uh, one for, for each prime number. Right. So let me make the following definition. So let P be a prime number. Um, so, uh, right, so, so given a rational number, so given rational number X and Q, I'm going to define the p-adic valuation. So or, which I'm going to denote by org sub p of x. This is called a p-adic valuation. Uh, well, it's going to be the number of uh, factors of p that occurs in x. So it's, uh, well, if you write x as a fraction, it's the number of factors of p in the numerator minus the number of factors in the denominator. Uh, so in other words, if x is equal to, uh, you can always write x as some power of p, some power of p, uh, p to the r times m divided by n, where m and n are co-prime to p, then the p-adic valuation is equal to r. 
Um, right, so or, or, ord p of x is, is some integer. And, and by convention, we're going to say that ord p of 0 is equal to infinity. Um, so ord p is a function from the rational numbers uh, to the integers uh, union infinity, uh, called the p-adic valuation. Um, right, so, so, so this p-adic valuation is going to satisfy the following properties. Uh, so uh, Right, so first is that the p-adic valuation of x times y uh, is equal to the p-adic valuation of x plus the p-adic valuation of y uh, by, I guess, by unique factorization. Um, the p-adic valuation of x plus y is going to be greater than or equal to the minimum of the p-adic valuation of x and the p-adic valuation of y. That's because, well, if x is divisible by p to the r and y is divisible by p to the s, then x plus y is divisible by p to the minimum of r and s. Um, right, and so finally, well, this was essentially sort of by convention, the p-adic valuation of x is equal to infinity if and only if x is equal to zero. Okay. So, uh, so now we can define the p-adic, so that's a p-adic valuation. And because of these properties, what we can do is define the following. So we're gonna define the p-adic absolute value of x to be p to the negative of the p-adic valuation of x. So this is the p-adic absolute value. So this p-adic absolute value is, is, is a function that has the property that will it's, it's, it's a, so roughly it's small, it's gonna be small if and only if X is divisible by a high power of P, sort of by, by construction, the p-adic valuation is large if, if you have a number which is divisible by a high power of P, which means that this p-adic absolute value is small. And so if we look at the, the properties one, two, and three above, they, they translate naturally into properties of the p-adic absolute value. So first of all, we have that the absolute value, the p-adic absolute value of X times Y is the absolute value of X times the absolute value of y. Um, second, we have that the p-adic absolute value of x plus y is at most the maximum of the p-adic absolute value of x and the p-adic absolute value of y. Uh, and finally, the p-adic absolute value of x is equal to zero if and only if x is equal to zero. Um, so, so this just comes from translating the properties of the p-adic valuation. And now we observe that these are, well, these are almost exactly the properties needed to ensure that you have an absolute value. So these are close to the axioms of an absolute value, uh, except that instead of the triangle inequality, we have something that's actually a lot stronger, which is, uh, so instead of, of the triangle inequality, uh, we have this property that the absolute value of x plus y is less than or equal to the maximum instead of the sum of the absolute value of x and the absolute value of y. So in particular, so this is stronger. So in particular, the p-adic absolute value is an absolute value function, but it, in fact, it satisfies this even stronger property, which is called the non-Archimedean property. So, so this is, so this is indeed an absolute value, uh, but it satisfies this additional condition, which is called being non-Archimedean. Right. So, so, so for example, uh, I mean, this is saying that if you have any integer, its p-adic absolute value is, uh, is at most one. So for example, the p-adic absolute value is less than or equal to one on the integer c. And I mean, where is it large? It's, it's, it's large on something like one over p to the 1,000. OK. So, uh, right, so we have the following definition, which is that the p-adic numbers uh, is defined as a completion 
of, uh, of the rational numbers with respect to the p-adic absolute value. Uh, so in particular, the p-adic absolute, uh, the p-adic numbers are themselves have an absolute value. So, so this p-adic absolute value extends canonically to qp and qp is complete with respect to it. In other words, Cauchy sequences uh, automatically converge. So it's, it's, it's a completion as a, as a field with absolute value of the rational numbers with respect to the p-adic. Um, with the p-adic number. So this is entirely analogous to the construction of the real numbers as the completion with respect to the usual absolute value. Um, okay. So, right, so I guess maybe we should think a little bit about, um, so, you know, how, how do we think about elements of the p-adic numbers? Well, if you think about, you know, how, how, how do you think about an element of the real numbers? Well, you can abstractly define it as an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences, um, a Cauchy sequences of rational numbers. So, so that's sort of Cauchy with respect to the um, the Archimedean absolute value. And sort of one, one sort of example of this is that you could have a decimal expansion. So if you have a decimal expansion, that gives you a real number uh, because you can think of sort of the truncations of the decimal expansion as giving you a bunch of rational numbers and those form a Cauchy sequence in uh, with respect to the usual absolute value and the limit is, is, well, it's the infinite decimal expansion, it's the associated real number. So in the real numbers, we can represent um, any real number via a decimal expansion. And right, so just, it's, I mean, again, I just wanna emphasize, so, so, so this completion, it's, uh, I mean, it's an element of the completion. You can think of it as an equivalence class of Cauchy. I mean, it, it is defined to be an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences. So, so an element of QP is, well, by definition, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers, Cauchy with respect to the p-adic absolute value, and that's defined up to equivalence. But we wanna make things a little bit sort of more explicit. So, so when we think about the real numbers, often we think about a decimal expansion, which uh, in particular is a way of representing a real number as a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers, namely the truncations of the decimal expansion. Um, and in fact, there's something entirely sort of analogous to that uh, over the p-adic numbers. Uh, so, right, so proposition, so any p-adic number has a unique p-adic expansion uh, of the form. It's a sum from i, well, i is gonna start with some, some negative integer. So, and then it's gonna go all the way to infinity. And it's a sum of a sub i times p to the i where a sub i ranges over 0, 1, dot, 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 through p minus 1. So given any p-adic, uh, so right, so given any p-adic number, you can, you can write it in a p-adic expansion, uh, well, in sort of an expansion of, of base p in this form. So note that, um, right, so, so note that this is different from the usual sort of decimal expansion or binary expansion, if you prefer, uh, of, of, of a real number. Uh, so note that the expansion goes in the opposite direction. Uh, sorry, so there was a question, yes. Uh, sorry, so when I say I greater than or, well, I, Right, so this means that i is starting at minus n for some, some n large. So, so it's it's a, it's an it's an infinite sum, uh, but it 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 uh, starts. It doesn't go. It's not infinite to negative infinity. So if that helps, uh, I mean, kind of like a decimal expansion, right? I mean, it it it's finite in one direction. Um, sorry, uh, there's a question from from Garrett. 
Yes. Um, so just like with um, the decimal versus binary and the real numbers, mm -hmm. can we have like some sort of base change in the p-adic numbers um, in terms of that like powered sum, like instead of like doing it with respect to p, with respect to um, some other number p prime? Right. So that's a good question. Um, yeah. So, right. So maybe I should, yeah. So maybe I should say some things about, so this is a problem. You know, I'll, I'll say something about the proof and maybe I should say some things. I should try to sort of compare and contrast what happens with the real numbers. Um, right. So over the real numbers, um, yeah. So, right. So you, you can, you can do a decimal expansion, but you can also do a binary expansion or a ternary expansion and so forth. Over the p-adic numbers, well, you have to be a little bit careful because uh, so what, what does, first of all, what does this even mean? This means that you're taking an infinite sum and the infinite sum has to, I mean, you, you're supposed to think of that as a limit of finite sums, which, uh, you know, is giving you some sort of Cauchy sequence. And for that, what you need is that you need the terms to go to zero if, 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 if the infinite sum is going to converge. Um, well, so in fact, a, sort of a fun consequence of the non-Archimedean property is that for an infinite sum to converge in the p-adic setting, it just suffices. It's necessary and sufficient for the terms to go to zero. Um, but so, for example, so, so what does this infinite sum mean? It, it means that it's, you know, you're taking the sum of the a sub i times p to the i, but the point is that that's going to zero. Those terms are going to zero because p has absolute value less than one. Um, so, right, so maybe I can add this to the note. This converges. This even makes sense to begin with because, well, the absolute value of p is, well, it's one over p. So, in fact, for what I'm saying right now, it's not, you can sort of normalize the p adic absolute value however you choose. The key thing is that the absolute value of p is less than one. Um, so so that, that's why this actually converges. But on the other hand, if you were to choose a different prime number, so if you were to choose some prime number q, then the absolute value of q would be equal to one. So this wouldn't converge. I mean, if you, if you, wrote it, if you tried to expand p-adic numbers q-adically, it wouldn't, it wouldn't converge anymore. So what you could do is you could try to, for example, you could expand it p-squared adequately and so forth, but you have to choose that. Yeah. Okay, so this converges because the absolute value of, of p is, is equal to one over p. So this, this infinite sum actually sort of makes sense. Um, so in the that's why also it goes in the, in the opposite, opposite direction as the decimal expansion. And decimal expansion converges because one over 10 is less than one at the Archimedean setting in the, uh, but here P is less than one, or the absolute value of P is less than one. Um, okay, so, so right, so it, it goes in the opposite direction. It's uh, need to use base P. I mean, you could also use like base p squared, or I guess you could use any base that's divisible by p, but usually you want to just use base p. Um, so maybe one other point that's actually kind of important is that the p adic, so the decimal expansion is not unique of a real number uh, because 0.9 repeating is equal to one, for example, uh, but the p adic uh, expansion is actually unique. Um, so, so in that sense, the p-adic expansion is actually, it's, it's more canonical than the decimal expansion uh, because it's, it's, really, it's really unique. Um, okay. Right, so, so, how, how, you know, so why, is, why is something like this true? Well, uh, right. Okay. All right, so I'll just write this. So unlike the decimal expansion, Right, so how do you produce a p-adic expansion? Um, right, so for example, let's, let's first say, so, so if, you, if you have a p-adic uh, number, you can think of it as a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers that are getting closer and closer to each other in the p-adic topology. Um, so suppose, given a, um, right, so suppose you're given a p-adic um, number, it uh, yields a Cauchy sequence. of rational numbers uh, in the p-adic topology. 
And yeah, I mean, maybe let's let me just make things even sort of simpler for myself by assuming that you have a sequence of integers. And then what you do is, well, any integer has a finite p-adic expansion. Finite base p expansion. And if you have a sequence of integers that are Cauchy in the p-adic topology, then these base p expansions, they're going to sort of stabilize in any given range of digits. So, I mean, of course, the, the base p expansion can it can go off to, to positive infinity, but in any finite range, it's going to stabilize and it's going to have no negative terms. So given a Cauchy sequence, the collection of base p expansions stabilizes. And that that it's, well, it's going to stabilize in any finite range. And the, the limit is going to be the, the p-adic expansion. The limit is going to be an infinite expansion of the associated p-adic number. Okay. And so, right, so in general, you, you're allowed to have some, right, so in general, you might be working with rational numbers, uh, but you can do something kind of like this. So if you have a rational number, you can always find something, some finite expansion in base p, such that it's p-adically very close to it, to, to any rational number. And if you have a sequence of rational numbers that form something Cauchy in the p-adic topology, then that's, um, that's going to end up converging. Um, Okay, so maybe just as an example, uh, right, so, so uh, one over one minus p is gonna equal one plus p plus p squared plus p cubed plus delta dot. So this doesn't make sense over, uh, over the rational number, or this doesn't make sense with the real numbers, but it does make sense in the p-adic numbers. Okay. So that's at least a sketch of of um, of why this is um, why this why this fact is true, and this is roughly how you should, you know, or this is roughly how you can think about like sort of representing a p-adic number, which is that it's you know it, it has some sort of p-adic um, p-adic expansion. Okay, so as we've been saying, you should sort of think of the p-adic numbers as in some way analogous to the real numbers. Um, because right, it's it's defined with it, the p-adic numbers are defined as a completion of the rational numbers, but instead of with respect to the usual absolute value, with respect to the p-adic absolute value. So I want to discuss some of sort of the comparisons between the p-adic numbers and the real numbers. Um, so they they have some similarities, um, but also some sort of pretty dramatic differences. And one similarity is that they're both locally compact. So both, well, so both of these are, I mean, both of these have absolute values. So in particular, they, they give you metric spaces and topological spaces, uh, and both of them are locally compact. So if you have a closed disk uh, of, of some finite radius, then in the real numbers and in the p-adic numbers, uh, these, are, these are gonna be compact. Um, and this is really useful. This means that, for example, if you have any bounded sequence, it has a convergent subsequence. And I mean, this is one of the things that's going to, it's going to make it, it's going to make it a lot easier to solve equations in the p-adic numbers or in the, in the real numbers than, um, than over, um, over the rational numbers. Right, so, so both, are, both are examples of, uh, of locally, compact, um, locally compact fields. Um, but now let me maybe say a difference. So a difference is that um, the p-adic numbers so the, the, uh, are, um, are, are non-Archimedean, which means that QP uh, contains a subring given by ZP, 
which is all those elements x of qp, such that the absolute value of x is less than or equal to one. So in other words, the unit disk in qp. Um, so the unit disk is, so equivalently, it's gonna be those piadic expansions. going from zero to infinity instead of from you know, minus 10 to infinity. So, um, right, so this is the difference between the piadic numbers and the real numbers because in the real numbers, if you take the unit disk, it's not a subring, it's not closed under addition. But because QP is non-Archimedean, if you have two piadic numbers whose absolute value is less than one, then their, their sum is also, um, is, also going to be, um, is also going to be less than or equal to one. Um, and so that's going to make ZP into, into actually a commutative ring. And um, well, so, so, so ZP is a commutative ring. And in fact, one way of thinking about an element of ZP, so as I said, ZP, you can think of it as it's those piadic expansions that start from zero and go to infinity instead from uh, from you know, minus 10 or something. Um, and you can think of an element of ZP as a compatible system of congruence classes mod P to the N for each N. So more formally, it's the inverse limit, inverse limit of Z mod P to the N. Uh, and so what that means is that it's compatible systems of congruence classes mod p to the n for each n. Okay. Right, so there's no way of producing sort of an analogous subring in, in the real numbers. Um, but in the piadic numbers, you have this nice subring of, um, of the disk at radius one. Um, okay, so this is a fundamental difference. Uh, another fundamental difference is, yeah, if you think sort of you know, topologically, so the real numbers are connected. I mean, I guess if you think about, I mean, for example, if you think about real numbers via data and cuts, I mean, this is really sort of fundamental that you build the real numbers so that they're connected. Um, so the question, what is an inverse limit? Sorry, I guess this is, uh, this is a definition. Uh, so maybe I won't define inverse limits in general, but a, a, a piadic integer can be specified as a system of congruence classes modulo p to the n for each n. So, I mean, if you look at like the first n digits of the piadic expansion, that's determining the congruence class mod, uh, I guess, mod p to the n plus one or p to the n. Um, and so as, as you sort of allow an infinite expansion, that, that means you're, you're allowing a compatible system of congruence classes modulo p to the n for, for each n. Um, okay. So, um, Sorry, R is connected. Yeah. So, so now let me explain another fundamental difference, which is that, yeah, if you think sort of topologically, R is connected. Um, and um, well, the piadic numbers are not connected. Um, so the piadic numbers are not only not connected, I guess they're what uh, what's called totally disconnected. Uh, but maybe instead of trying to define, well, let me just say that what, so in fact, I think it maybe slows a little bit on the problem set. So uh, the piadic numbers, they, they, it looks like, um, well, if you, if you look at any disk in the piadic numbers, it's, it's both open and closed, and it looks, like, uh, it looks like a Cantor set. So for example, if you look at the ZP, which is the unit disk, so that's the unit disk in QP, uh, then this is both open and closed in, um, in QP. Right, so you, I guess if you have a connected space, you don't have, you're not allowed to have many open and closed subsets. Um, so, so ZP is both open and closed. So that's, again, this is a, a consequence of really the non-Archimedean property. Um, if, yeah, so it, it's really a consequence of the non-Archimedean property because when you say ZP is the unit disk, um, it's the unit disk, I guess, centered at, um, at, at zero, but you could actually center it at any point of the unit disk because of the non-Archimedean property. And uh, that means that it's, it's, uh, it's 
Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. That's right. Thanks. Uh, sorry, the question was about definition of totally disconnected. Um, uh, and in fact, ZP is 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 homeomorphic to a Cantor set. Right, and so, so I mean, that's because you can, uh, ZP is sort of, uh, I mean, an element of ZP is, is literally the same thing as a piadic expansion. Uh, well, a piadic expansion starting in, you know, starting at zero, uh, which is some sort of, yeah. So, whereas a, a real number is, or say a real number of the unit interval is, is given by a decimal expansion, but you've also sort of, you mod it out, but you've quotient by some equivalence relation on, on those decimal expansions. and so it might not sound like a lot, but somehow topologically they look very different. The unit interval is this sort of nice connected uh, compact thing, and ZP is maybe a little bit more unfamiliar. It's uh, it, it's more like a Cantor. I mean, it is literally homeomorphic to a Cantor set. Um, so I mean, that's that's wonderful in many ways, but uh, it's it's also sort of different, and um, maybe it takes some time to get used to. Um, so let me also mention sort of one general uh, difference. So right, so this is somehow the world of non-Archimedean fields instead of the world of uh, Archimedean absolute values. And in fact, um, if, if if you work with Archimedean absolute values, so an Archimedean absolute value just means something which is not non-Archimedean. Uh, in fact, the only complete our complete Archimedean fields are the real numbers and the complex numbers. But in fact, you have tons of, uh, of, of fields which are complete with respect to, um, so lots of complete non-Archimedean fields. So in particular, if you start with the real numbers, it's not, I mean, it's not algebraically closed, but it's once you add a square root of minus one, it becomes algebraically closed. But over the piadic numbers, that's no longer true. There are lots of ways you can enlarge the piadic numbers and get sort of larger examples of uh, fields which are complete with respect to um, a complete non-Archimedean absolute value. Um, so lots to extend um, to complete non-Archimedean fields. I mean, so one example is that QP has, uh, I mean, the algebraic closure of QP is not finite over QP. So it's not like the complex numbers, you just add a square root of minus one. Um, but any finite extension of QP is gonna have, is gonna be a complete non-Archimedean field as well. Um, but you can also, you can also find even larger, much larger constructions. Um, there's sort of no size limit. There's sort of no size limit in, in the complete non-Archimedean case. There's a size limit in the Archimedean case. You can only, you can't get any larger than the complex numbers. Um, okay, so I guess bearing you know these facts in mind, so there are some similarities and also some very salient differences. Um, somehow the principle, uh, well, one principle, is that you should think about the real numbers and the piadic piadic numbers as being sort of on a similar footing uh, for at least for some questions. So for some questions. Well, for example, the questions involving quadratic forms that are going to be discussed in this course, um, one can regard the real numbers and all the piadic numbers on sort of a similar footing and uh, sort of consider them together somehow. Um, right, so, so, so maybe let me give a little bit of motivation for why you, know, why you might consider this. Well, in fact, there's a theorem uh, of Ostrowski. So I think this is on the problem set, which is already in Sokoko. Um, so the, the theorem of Ostrowski is that any absolute value on the real numbers, oh, sorry, not on the real numbers, on the, on the rational numbers is, uh, well, up to equivalence. It, it is the Archimedean absolute value or it's uh, the piadic absolute value. So any non-trivial absolute value 
on Q is equivalent to uh, the Piatic absolute value or the Archimedean absolute value, which I'm, maybe I'm going to denote as so the usual one, which I'll denote with an infinity subscript. Um, yeah, and so the claim is that this is actually a list of all of them. And I should just say what equivalent means. Um, and equivalence is sort of a question of normalization. So as, as I mentioned in the, in the definition of the piatic absolute value, it didn't really matter. So actually it'll be convenient for something in the future, but it'll be, you can, def, you can, you can also define the absolute value of P to be say one half instead of one over P. And it would still give you the same topology, it would still give you the same notion of convergence. And if you complete the same notion of completion. Um, so equivalent means here, uh, the same up to raising to a power. And if you have, if you have equivalent absolute values, then that doesn't, it's not gonna change the notion of completion or the topology and so forth. Right, so, so there's this complete classification of all absolute values on the rational numbers. They're either piatic for some prime P uh, or they're the rational numbers. Um, yeah, it's a trivial one. Um, and so, um, yeah, so somehow the idea is that you should consider all of these completions sort of together. Um, and so this turns out to be sort of a useful, um, you know, it's somehow a useful philosophy for, um, for various purposes. Um, so let me, let me give sort of one example, which is, uh, which is the product formula. So if X is a rational number, well, I guess X is a non-zero rational number. Then the statement is that the product as P ranges over all the prime numbers and also infinity of the absolute value of X at P. So we're allowed, we're also including the Archimedean absolute value uh, is equal to one. Um, and so I guess there's no convergence issue. So almost all the factors are one. It's so all but finitely many. factors are R1. And th so this infinite product makes sense. Um, there's no convergence issue and, and, and the product is equal to one. Um, so this is saying that, yeah, you, you have all these different chaotic absolute values and somehow when you combine them, you, well, you get this nice formula. Um, and so this, this is, well, in this case, it's not hard to prove because you can, for example, you can use unique factorization and you can check it for a prime number P and then there are only two contributions and, um, and it's gonna fall out. Um, but there are also lots of, you know, there are also other instances of, 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 of this type of, um, um, of this type of philosophy. Um, so later, so probably in Justin's lectures, um, we'll see that uh, quadratic reciprocity uh, can be interpreted, can be formulated as, as a product form as sort of a similar product formula uh, over all primes and infinity. So it's gonna be a, a product over all primes and infinity and each of the products at each P is gonna be somehow defined on the piatic numbers or on the real numbers of P as infinity. Um, so yeah, so this is sort of, and, and, and so this is sort of an, this is sort of nice because uh, when you formulate it in that way, also it generalizes very nicely to, for example, other number fields, um, and uh, and in fact even to function fields. So so to finite extensions of uh, like FP, um, the Ron series of not Ron series uh, rational functions over FP. Um, so I guess there'll be a little bit about that in the in the problem set. Um, and in fact one of the main uh, um, so one of the main theorems, I guess, of the, of the mini course is, is the theorem of Hassel minkowski which I think maybe I will just formulate now. So a quadratic form, well, it has a non-trivial root, or I guess is isotropic. So a quadratic form over Q If and only if it's isotropic over QP 
for each p and over the real numbers. Um, so this is called a, yeah. Now, well, maybe let me also say two quadratic forms. So that, in fact, it's a consequence of this fact, but two quadratic forms over q are isomorphic um, if and only if they are isomorphic uh, over each QP and over R. So I guess this is called a, well, this is called a local to global principle. It's, it's saying that if you want to solve a problem, well, this particular type of problem involving quadratic forms uh, over the rational numbers, then it suffices to solve the problem over the p-adic numbers for each prime p and over the real numbers. Um, and it, it turns out, so I guess um, probably I will explain this next time. Um, it's it turns out it's it's pretty it's much easier to to think about these types of questions over well over the real numbers. We know that we, we can do it by by looking at signs. And um, similarly over the p-adic numbers, we can we can somehow uh, answer these questions by looking at congruences. Um, yeah, so this is going to be one of the main um, main results of of the course, and I guess um, yeah. So I guess I guess it's a bit of an well. So I guess next time what I'm going to do is I will I will try to continue with the p-adic numbers. So so um, I will try to continue with the p-adic numbers, and in particular, I will try to explain how you can solve equations um, over over the p-adic numbers. Um, using, um, I guess, using something called Hensel's lemma. Um, yeah, so essentially what, so you'll start to explore this a little bit on the homework, um, but uh, well, right, so for, for example, over the, when, when, when you, in general, when you complete, like when you complete from the rational numbers to the real numbers, you, you add lots of solutions. I mean, there are lots of equations that you can't solve in the rational numbers that you can solve in the real numbers. Uh, for example, you don't have a square root of two in the rational numbers, but you have in the real numbers. And similarly, when you sort of complete in the p-adic sense, um, you're adding solutions to lots of, lots of equations. Um, but to try to determine what, what things you're adding, it's, uh, you have to somehow look at congruences and that's, um, that's given by Hensel's, Hensel's So I guess we'll explore that next time. Okay, so I think it's maybe a good place to stop for today. So yeah, thanks, I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit for, um, for questions. Yeah. Um, okay, so a question, what, uh, what are some results in real analysis that depend on local compactness? Um, well, right, so I guess local compactness, okay, so maybe let me formulate, so let me formulate a, yeah, let me formulate a result in, in that vein. So, I mean, if you think about and so, 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 right. So, what is local compactness giving you? It, it, it for example, it's giving you that if you have a, uh, a sequence of real numbers which is bounded, then there's always a, a convergent subsequence. Um, and um, right. So, I guess maybe we could give the following example. So, so example. So, given a polynomial, polynomial equation f of x equals zero, where f of x is in z brackets x, and actually it could be in many variables if you want. So suppose uh, you can solve f of x is congruent to zero modulo p to the n for each n. So suppose you don't know if you can solve this equation f of x equals zero in the integers. But let's suppose you can solve this equation modulo any power of p. Um, so in, again, in the integers. Um, then the claim is, then you can solve it in, in, in uh, so then you can solve f of x equals zero in, in the p-adic integers. And in fact, it's, a, it's an if and only if. Um, so, so, right, so why is that? I mean, it's, if you have a solution modulo p to the n for each n, well, I mean, you can, you, well, let's say you have an integer solution modulo p to the n for each n, then you get some sequence of integers. And 
there is, it doesn't have to converge p-adically, but there's some subsequence that converges p-adically by local compactness. And so some subsequence that has to converge in the p-adic topology, and that is going to give you a solution of f-fx equals zero in, in, in the p-adic integers. And conversely, if you have a solution in the p-adic integers, well, then you can approximate that uh, modulo any power of p by an integer. Um, yeah, so for example, that's something that, that local compactness is giving you, yeah. Right, so what we'll see next time is, um, so Hensel's lemma is gonna give you a criterion. So, so in principle, this is telling you, you know, how do you solve an equation in, in, in QP or let's just say ZP for simplicity? Well, you need to be able to solve an equation in the integers modulo any congruence. And well, in principle, that's an infinite number of conditions to check. And what Hensel's lemma, which I will talk about next time, uh, gives you is that in fact, you only need to, um, you only need to check it modulo some, like some finite power of P or in fact, just mod P if, um, your derivative is not divisible by p, and then you can automatically sort of get a p-adic solution. Um, Great, thank you. And I'm going to my office hour now. Okay. If there are any more questions, I can. Uh, may I also try to drop by the office hours? Um, but... Okay. Well, if not, I guess we'll we'll see you tomorrow, or we're in office hours, and problem sets already uh, posted. So. Uh, actually, Akil, oh. can I mm -hmm. ask you a question? Um, about sure. uh, yesterday's property. Yes. Um, at the beginning, uh, you, let me go find the page first. Yeah, at the beginning uh, of yesterday, you mentioned about uh, any n-dimensional quadratic form over fq, sub q is isomorphic to one comma one comma one comma d, mm -hmm. the one comma one d. I wonder if this is for n isometry form or just any quadratic form? Uh, sorry, any, any isom, sorry, mm -hmm. there's isometric to something with that form, right? Yeah, that, um, so, so any, any quadratic uh, form can be, has a, this a uh, normal form that you can That's decompose right. into the power of the hyperbolic, um, and plus a V prime, which is N iso, 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 isotropic, and I saw, I don't know how to read that. Well, I mean, I think, sorry, over, over the, yeah, so over the over a finite field, the, the normal form is uh, so you can always um, uh, yeah, so you can you can always write it as a direct sum of copies of of like one. I mean, you can always diagonalize it, but in fact, you can mm -hmm. always diagonalize it where there it's all plus ones except for one term. So, uh, yeah. So so this mm -hmm. is for this is for general. It's not just for an 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 isotropic uh, form. So even this for, is for any form. That's so right. so what I'm wondering is uh, so mm -hmm. in general we write a hyperbolic form as one comma negative one. So mm -hmm. here suppose I have a so what is a hyperbolic plane? So if it is a hyperbolic plane, would that be one comma one or one comma negative one? I'm a little confused. Oh, so in general, the hyperbolic plane over any field is given by one comma minus one. I mean, so it's right. the hyperbolic plane is the form x squared minus y squared, for example, or, or you could also write it as the form x y. So what about if it is for f sub q, then would it be one comma one or one comma? So, so, so that statement should still be true even for um, hyperbolic uh, form, right? So, so what do I expect about the D? I think- Right, so if you, have a, if you have a hyperbolic form, just a one, so if you have the hyperbolic plane, then mm -hmm. it's one comma minus one. So it's already in that form. It's already in the normal uh, form that you're looking okay. for. So it's but one. I mean, yeah. But then, then, then that means that the uh, so that means that all the previous ones that's going to be uh, the portion for the v prime for the 
and isotropic portion? So not quite because, no? well, so the key feature of, sorry, so maybe there are two, so there are two different sort of normal forms mm -hmm. that maybe are coming up here. So what, there's a normal form that you can do over any field. Well, I mean, over any field, a quadratic form, you can decompose it into an anisotropic plus a, a bunch of copies of the hyperbolic plane. Right, yeah. So that, that's something you can do over any field. Uh -huh. um, and over, over the, uh, and, and the anisotropic part is sort of uniquely determined. Um, in, if you're over a finite field, any form of dimension, at least three is automatically isotropic. So what you can what you can do in, in over a finite field or over any C uh, C one field or any field of U invariant times two, um, is that you can write any form as a direct sum of copies of the hyperbolic plane plus um, a two dimensional or plus an at most two dimensional anisotropic form. Um, but this was actually a different normal form that I was I think at the beginning of yesterday's lecture, which is that mm -hmm. you can always write it as a bunch of copies of plus one. And then at most one term, which is not plus one in a diagonal mm. form. Uh, so there's a different. So I'm very confused now. So so suppose I have just one comma one all the way to one. Mm -hmm. So is this um, mm, do we know or not know that whether it's um, it's um, an isotropic or not, just by oh. The foam. Well, so it, once once you have at least three terms, it's always isotropic if you're over a finite field. Mm, that's true because it's dimension right. three, so it has to be as isotropic. So even though if it's one one one, that would still be isotropic. That's right. I mean, in fact, even one comma one can be isotropic. So it depends on minus whether minus one is the square in your field. Um, I right. see. I see. Right, and it also depends on the so if if it is. Tell me if this is true, that it also depends on the basis you choose, right? Because you always have, if it is uh, hyperbolic, you have to choose the basis E1 and E2 such that each of them is isotropic. Yeah, yeah. such that well, E1 dot E1 is zero, E2 dot E2 is zero, and then E1 dot E2 is not zero. Uh, so if you have a hyperbolic form or hyperbolic plane, you, you can choose such a basis, that's right. Yeah, okay. So, so, so just because that I write it as a one comma one, that doesn't mean that it's an isotropic. Okay. No, no, not at all. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so okay. it, I mean, in general, one comma one is, right. So if you have the form, if you have a two dimension, if you have one comma one, then if you're in a field where minus one is a sum of two squares, uh, mm -hmm. or sorry, if you're in a field where minus one is a square, then that's always isomorphic to one comma minus one, in which case it's a hyperbolic right. plane by yeah. rescaling. But if minus one is not a square, then it's an isotropic. Okay, okay, yeah. I think I understand a little bit better. Thank you. Sure. Okay, bye. Or actually, any any more questions or? No, uh, yeah. Basically, on what on what you were saying. So basically, for example, if we had a if we had the one one, you know, diag diagonalized the mm -hmm. binary quadratic form over f five, where minus one is the same thing as four, so it's a square. Then that's a hyper mm -hmm. that's a hyperbolic plane, right? That's right. I see. Thank you. Yep. Bye bye. 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 See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.